Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Elliot Whittington. I'm CISL's direct, uh, policy director and also the director of CLG Europe. It's Europe facing partnership of businesses uh, working to advance the transition towards a sustainable economy. We're very pleased to welcome you today um, uh, for uh, what should be a really interesting conversation around our new research work are looking at uh, the role of carbon border adjustment mechanisms, and particularly in the light of the Europe's new proposal for a carbon border adjustment mechanism. So we've got a packed set of attendees and, and uh, some really informative conversations, um, which we will which we will go through shortly. Um, we're going to start off with a couple of uh, welcoming remarks, and then move into a presentation of our research, followed by some reactions and reflections from, from various different people. So. Um, so just to kind of cover that, we've got Claire Shine, CISL's Director and CEO, um, and also Kasper Klinger, Vice President for European Government Affairs from Microsoft, who have very kindly supported this work. Um, the report will be presented by the research team, um, followed by a short Q&A session to kind of dig into any kind of technical details they need to help illuminate and explain any details that, that people have, um, questions they have about the report, followed by reflections are, um, from uh, both a mixture of uh, business commentators, but also EU member state third country representatives. Um, so we will have somebody from the French government, somebody from the um, US Climate Leadership Council. So we've got a, a, a couple of different perspectives there. But then uh, discussion of representatives within Europe. So we have European Commission, um, somebody from the German Institute for International Security Affairs, a perspective from Microsoft and a perspective from SSAB. Um, within that, there will be time for, for some Q&A and some reflection and then it will bring it together for a close. So hopefully, hopefully we should have a really good conversation and we should really open up this important and yet complicated issue for, for further reflection. For those of you who haven't already see it, seen it, on the handouts for today's session, you could see the agenda um, or, or the conversation if you want to refer to it, but also our new report and the biographies of all the speakers so that if you want to look up any of their background details, feel free to. Well, we have a number of speakers to hear from, so you, you don't want to hear too much more from me. I'm going to hand over, without too much further ado, to Claire Shine, CISL's director and CEO. Um, Claire is an a, a active leader of, of CISL and, and very keen to kind of help uh, us advance this role of looking into the issues where we are, we're establishing new questions, helping us call out tomorrow. So Claire, over to you. Hello, everybody. And I hear a doorbell, so clearly my time has arrived. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you today. And as Elliot said, um, we're hugely ambition, ambitious for taking this work with CISL and partners forward. CISL has been working um, at the frontiers on climate since 1989, steadily raising the bar for bolder ambition with business, finance and government and through education and leadership. Right now, it would be so easy to think all roads lead to COP26, but the real test comes afterwards, of course. Getting the change we need at the speed we need is going to need a bold reset of policy, legal and business frameworks and an integrated focus on benefiting people, nature and climate. So the research behind today's webinar is really groundbreaking and I know it is guaranteed to spark hot debate today and beyond. Two quick observations um, from me first. The EU has long been a leader in testing and modeling new policies and new ways to advance cross-border and region-wide sustainability. The Fit for 55 package launched in uh, this summer is a really bold suite of policy proposals. It is already stimulating energetic debate, whether it can actually deliver that necessary transformational change and thus provide a beacon, a role model, or something to do differently in other parts of the world. Now, the proposal to launch the CBAM, it's the first, it's the first in the world. It's a bold step forward. It's uncharted waters. As the title says, we're on the borderline here. And it's going to test the relationship between different legal and policy regimes. It raises far-reaching questions for the international trade regime. And as many of you know so much better than me, that intersect of trade, green goods and services is going to be one of the most dynamic areas of international uh, progress over the years to come. So for that reason, um, I'm really happy to join today's webinar in launching this report. 
as Elliot said, uh, CISL seeks to call out tomorrow. We're looking very strongly at foresight, influence and reach. How do we both see what is coming down the tracks, use the kind of networks that everybody on this call has access to, to get that change quicker and have a reach in terms of making ourselves understood, making this work legitimate and thinking about that combined benefit, as I said, for people, nature and climate. Now, this report in particular is breaking new ground even for CISL. It brings together macroeconomic uh, econometric analysis, an analysis of the legal and political acceptability, and it covers a range of alternatives or complements, depending which way uh, the mechanism goes forward. It's hugely ambitious. We're with the right people, and I am enormously grateful to Microsoft for having supported and made this research possible. So with that, thank you again for attending. And now I'm delighted to hang, hand over to Casper Klinger, who is the Vice President for European Government Affairs at Microsoft. Casper, the screen is yours. Well, thanks very much, Claire. And, and also thanks uh, to you, Elliot. It's, it's really nice to be here and to at least indirectly see all of you and, and to uh, be able to welcome you to what I think is an incredibly important event and launch uh, today. And uh, we're sort of in the middle of the change of seasons, and perhaps it is a good time to reflect a bit on what has happened in the past year. Uh, one that unfortunately has continued to be challenging with the evolving health crisis to the floods we saw across Europe, the wildfires, uh, and perhaps never it has been a more important uh, time to act and make progress on climate change than it is today. And by doubling down, as you also mentioned, Claire, on uh, its commitments rather than easing off in times of crisis, uh, in many ways, Europe has confirmed its leadership on sustainability from proposing an increased 2030 target for emissions reductions to turning Europe's climate goals into legal obligations and being the first major economy to put forward legislation to get it done. I think all of this is in many ways enormously impressive. And as part of that, as part of the Fit for 55 uh, legal proposal, the carbon border adjustment mechanism has caught, I think, everybody's attention. And Claire, I don't know if you use the word controversial, but it's certainly not something, as the report also shows, that is, is going to be easy to achieve. It is in many ways a first of its kind proposal that opens up for an important conversation around climate and trade and exposes the urgent need for common standards for carbon measurement and for accounting. And the EU has demonstrated, I think, tremendous leadership in advancing the conversation around measuring carbon flows in the economy, from reduction to removal and trade, and with that, advancing the transparency and accountability that progress also requires. And, you know, this is not only important, it is important because we, to have any hope of moving quickly along, we'll need a common foundation, a common taxonomy, that ensures that carbon emissions are measured accurately, consistently, and reliably. And I was going through the, uh, the report uh, over the weekend, and, and I think what is so evident and so compelling in the report is that the issue that climate and change bring forward are not at all easy. And it is in many ways for this reason that they require joint conversation, and this is why we are here today. And I'll be honest, and I think we all have to be honest in saying that we do not have all the answers. I certainly don't. I think the experts that put this report together have more answers than I do, nor do we necessarily know all the questions that we need to ask in a complex area like the one we're dealing with today. But I think what we do know and what the report spells out so clearly is that if we want to play a role in advancing our collective understanding, we need to focus on the findings that this report's put together. And this is exactly why we've been supporting from the Microsoft side a, I think, fantastic research team working on the different dimensions of the proposed EU CBAM, as well as other trade-related policies and how they interact with each other. From economic and environmental impacts to legal, political and diplomatic considerations, the analysis came together through, I think, a fascinating report whose launch we are super excited to support here today. As the research team put it in the report, this is a conversation and perhaps also a policy whose time has now come. And we can expect to hear, I think, a lot about it in the years to come. And I'm hopeful this will be one of the many interesting discussions that we can support and play a part in. Let me say a few words about why it is that we at Microsoft are supporting this and how we see our role and, and responsibility. 
I think the first thing to say is that as a technology company, as a global technology company, we, in a very principled way, believe that digital technologies will play a vital role in supporting and enabling policies like this, including on CBAM. Through new digital tools, we can hopefully assist our customers, our partners, European governments, global uh, governments in calculating and reducing emissions. And that's exactly why in July we announced what we call the Microsoft Cloud for Sustainability, enabling our customers and our partners to report, to record and to reduce their emissions on their path to net zero. We're eager to continue the conversation and play our part also in the years to come. And I'm also hopeful that this conversation can help enable what I would call stronger transatlantic ties, where the European Union and the United States can act as catalysts for strengthening the geopolitics of carbon around the world. And I think the rapidly growing focus on reducing carbon emissions, advancing carbon measurement and improving environmental equity on both sides of the pond gives really a renewed hope that this work will help bring every government to the table. And if we can notch and force that um, you know, work to happen and having governments come together, then I think we have played hopefully a helpful role in, in this area. And then looking ahead to, to next week and to COP26, uh, I think we have a real opportunity to come together and reflect on how this can connect to the global conversation and how together we can move more quickly and more profoundly to create a net zero uh, carbon economy in Europe and indeed around the world. So with these few words, uh, I would like to spend a little bit of time uh, embarrassing myself by thanking the research team for their work on the insightful report. And by embarrassing myself is that how I'm going to try and pronounce a lot of different and difficult surnames. And I will in advance ask for your, uh, your gentle appreciation that I will try and do my very best in this regard. Uh, first of all, let me th uh, thank Dr. Sana Makin and the research lead for the Center for Policy and Industrial Transformation at CISL. Let me thank Dr. Husuk Lee Makiyama, the Director of the European Center for International Political Economy. Let me thank Hector Pollitt, the Chief Economist at Cambridge Econometrics. Let me thank Professor Jorge E. Vinuales, the Cambridge Center for Environment, Energy and Natural Resource Governments. And then let me also use the opportunity as one of the, I guess, co-hosts of today's event to, to thank uh, our guests that are going to contribute to the discussion today. First of all, Katrina Rorke, the Vice President of Policy for Climate Leadership Council, Pierre uh, Jeremy from the French Ministry of the Economy, Antoine Colombani from the European Commission, Dr. Susanne Droge from the Stiftung Wissenschaft und Politik, and Thomas Hörnfeld from SSAB. And last but not least, I want to thank my Microsoft colleague and my very good friend, uh, Alberto Arribas, who will join the panel conversations later today and who knows a lot more about this topic than I will ever be able to uh, acquire in terms of knowledge. And last but not least, uh, a warm thank you to the CISL team, Claire, Elliot, everybody on your side who made all of this uh, happen today. We and also me personally look forward to the presentation of the report and the reflections also from country representatives and the panel conversations that will follow. So let me end up by just once again thanking all of you and looking forward to the conversations we have today. Thanks. Casper, thank you so much and thank you for your support, or Microsoft support for helping make this possible. I much uh, appreciated and I think what it should be a, a very interesting, fascinating discussion. So uh, both Casper and Claire uh, gave us the title of the report on the borderline. I should say to the audience, we have a, a large audience here on GoToWebinar, but also in LinkedIn. That's also the hashtag. So if you want to discuss it in social media, feel free to use that hashtag just to, so we can start to see how, what people's thoughts are, what people's reactions are, and take that feedback into account and, and, and build on it. Um, now, without too much further ado, so uh, the research team has been very helpfully introduced by Casper. Um, but I'm very pleased to ask Dr. Sana Markin and the, the research lead in my team to uh, present and the chief author of this report to present the report, talk us through it. Thank you, Sana. Um, many thanks, Elliot. Um, Aurora, can I have the next slide, please? Um, so this is the title of the report put together by a group of authors that Casper very kindly introduced. Uh, we are an interdisciplinary um, and independent team of researchers and we've been working on this for about five months now um, and obviously um, 
very much looking forward to hearing your thoughts um, on this report. Can I have the next slide, please? So our report covers various different topics. We start with an overview of CBAMs as a policy instrument. Um, we provide a quick overview of the reasoning for and against CBAMs. Um, we then look at why the EU is proposing a CBAM and uh, briefly outline the current EU CBAM proposal. We then look at some um, economic and environmental impacts. Uh, we assess questions around the legality. Uh, we look at the potential political and diplomatic implications. Um, and we finish by looking at what some of the alternatives to CBAMs would be. Next slide, please. So um, the economic impacts to begin with. So the modeling of the economic and environmental impacts was carried out by Cambridge Econometrics using their E3ME macroeconomic model. So this is a well-established model that has previously been used uh, many times by the European Commission, pr primarily in assessing their climate policy, but also other policies, um, including the 2030 impact assessment that came out last year. Um, the modelling involved various different scenarios with minor modifications, um, and all of this detail is available in the report. Um, the results show that the economic impacts would most likely be minor but positive for the EU. So we're looking at um, 0 0.2 to 0.4% improvement in the EU GDP by 2050. And this is in comparison to a baseline whereby the EU would meet its 1.5 degree compatible um, CO2 emissions targets but without a CBAM. Um, an EU CBAM could create around 600,000 jobs by 2050. Um, these would be across sectors. And if you just quickly look at the graph on the right, which you can explore in more detail in the report, a lot of the um, economic and employment benefits actually come from um, the revenue recycling. So the CBAM revenue being recycled within the EU um, to reduce um, income tax and VAT. Uh, the impacts on global level, so global GDP and some of the countries that we looked at in more detail are generally very small, uh, but overall positive. However, the GDP in Russia would most likely be adversely affected. Next slide, please. In terms of environmental impacts, um, the reduction in global CO2 emissions would be around 10 uh, megatons of CO2 uh, by 2050. Uh, which is about 0.023% of global emissions um, annually. Uh, there would be a slight increase in EU emissions due to increased industrial activity within the EU. Um, so overall, the main um, environmental or emissions benefit would most likely come around from the CBAM. If without a CBAM, it would become impossible um, to um, maintain a high carbon price or an increase in carbon price within the EU. And if this was the case, um, the presence of a CBAM within the EU could actually result in um, about 912 megatons of CO2 savings per year. Uh, by 2050, um, and as a result, uh, without the CBAM, um, it would be impossible for the EU to uh, meet its 2050 uh, climate neutrality target. Next slide, please. So I'm not going to talk you through this slide in detail. I'm just going to flag up that it's available in the report should you wish to look at it. Um, it sets out the various interrelationships between um, all of these um, factors that influence the emissions um, outcomes and the environmental outcomes, um, as well as the um, economic and employment impacts, both um, within and outside the EU. Next slide, please. Um, so moving on to the legal analysis, the legal analysis was carried out at four different levels. First, uh, the basis for adoption. So whether um, a CBAM within the EU would be a global treaty or an agreement among only a few states, or whether it would be regarded as unilateral action. Um, the second level was looking at the rules of conduct. Uh, in very basic terms, which rules may be breached by the CBAM. Uh, level three was looking at justification, so rules that could justify a violation of a rule of conduct. Um, and level four was looking at the remedies 
that could be um, used to adjust the measure to bring it into compliance with either the rules of conduct or a justification. So we then applied um, this um, analytical framework to the EU's current proposal. Um, the proposed EU CBAM would most likely be treated as a unilateral measure. So even though the EU is a group of 27 independent states, uh, from outside the EU, the EU is still seen as a single entity. In terms of the rules of conduct, the proposed EU CBAM would most likely be regarded as a regulation that is equivalizing the effects of another regulation, in this case, the EU ETS. Um, the judgment as to whether domestically produced goods covered by the CBAM, such as steel, would be seen to be alike um, with imported goods is extremely important. Um, if the goods are deemed to be alike, regardless of their different carbon content, the specific details um, of the carbon equivalization methodology uh, would be extremely important in determining whether the CBAM would be regarded as discriminatory. And it's worth noting that some of these details have not been yet made fully available in the current EU proposal. Um, there is a fair chance that the um, EU, um, EU CBAM could amount to a breach of both um, the national treatment and the most favoured nations clauses. However, this doesn't mean that it couldn't be justified. It could be justified on the grounds that um, as a measure to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, the CBAM would mitigate climate change and protect human life or health. It could also be justified on the grounds that um, it is a measure relating to an exhaustible natural resource, um, i.e. stable climate system also um, could be the carbon budget, for example. Um, however, there is an open question as to whether the EU CBAM would be regarded as less trade restrictive than other available measures. Um, it could also be seen as imposing the EU carbon price to other countries, which could be problematic. Um, however, even if the EU CBAM is seen to be in breach of international trade rules, it could later be brought into compliance. Uh, next slide, please. So the political and diplomatic considerations, we looked at these uh, both within the EU and internationally. Um, so within the EU, it's extremely important that we consider the CBAM, CBAM to be to, to be seen as a part of a bigger political agenda, um, in particular in the context of the EU Green Deal. Um, it's going to be subject to lengthy um, inter-institutional inter negotiations um, through the process of a trilogue that hasn't commenced yet. Um, the final proposal that emerges as a result will be shaped by both the EU's political economy and quite possibly some foreign pressures. Um, so it's likely to look very different to the current proposal. Um, in terms of member state views, we cover some of these in the report. Um, they are still being formed. They're likely to be diverse. They're likely to be subject to change. Um, and in some member states, the official view might actually be quite difficult to form because the percep uh, perceptions are internally divided, um, for example, uh, between producers um, and user industries. Uh, next slide, please. So looking at the international level, um, the options that are available to third countries um, include retaliation, negotiation and litigation. Um, and these options can be bilateral or multilateral. They can be symmetrical or asymmetrical. And we provide some examples of all of these in the report. Um, these response options are not mutually exclusive and they may be explored simultaneously or one after the other. So if a country retaliates against the EU now, it doesn't mean that they couldn't litigate against the EU later. Um, the responses from um, trade partner countries will most likely be influenced by their current relationship with the EU, um, as well as many of the country level factors, such as the presence um, or absence of um, ETS or carbon price. Um, some of the countries that rely heavily on the EU markets for their exports 
but are unlikely to qualify for an exemption, um, are likely to respond more aggressively. Um, in the report, we provide specific examples of Ukraine, the UK, the US and Russia. Um, and it's probably worth noting that the litigation is unlikely to happen until the EU CE ban becomes a law, um, but retaliation may take place um, much sooner. Next slide, please. So in section seven of the report, we also looked at what the alternatives to CBAMs could be. Um, CBAM is legally complicated and potentially politically very difficult. Um, some of the other options that we looked at uh, would be so, the so-called climate clauses in bilateral or multilateral trade agreements. Uh, there could be multilateral processes under the WTO or OECD convenership. Um, the development of new approaches under the trade and environmental sustainability structure discussions or the formation of so-called climate clubs, which was discussed quite extensively um, in a very good online event by SEPS last week. Uh, these could be used in conjunction with or instead of an EU CBAM, or it could also be possible that an EU CBAM could be the first step towards developing some of these other um, approaches. Um, many of these approaches could potentially be much more effective in driving decarbonisation than the sole use of carbon pricing or equalisation measures in the EU. Um, however, like the CBAM, these are subject to practical challenges um, and um, the extent of their true potential has not yet been systematically assessed. Next slide, please. So just in terms of conclusions, um, the politics of the current EU CBAM proposal does make WTO dispute quite likely, uh, but it doesn't mean that this dispute would necessarily result in a successful outcome. Um, if the EU is found to be in violation of the trade rules, the measures can be brought, um, I mean, the CBAM can be brought into compliance, and this would be without any retrospective penalties being payable. So the risk of retaliation or the loss of reputation, as in EU, the global champion of just transition and climate justice, are actually much greater than the risk of litigation. Um, there is also a silver lining that the standardised mechanisms that would need to be developed to measure carbon content in order to fairly implement the CBAM could actually enable other climate policies um, to be implemented in the future, um, so, well, particularly demand side policies. Um, an EU CBAM may be necessary to improve the political acceptability of ambitious climate policy within the EU and to um, support high carbon price. Um, and as such, it could be absolutely crucial element uh, in enabling EU to achieve its 2050 target. And last but not least, a well-designed EU CBAM could incentivize trade partners to implement more ambitious climate policies, um, and this could actually remove the need for um, an EU CBAM. And this is where I finish, and I would like to invite all my co-authors to join on a quick Q&A session. So if you please switch on your cameras and enable your microphones. Indeed. So we, we've asked the, the research team who authored the report to join us for this uh, session, this Q&A session. Um, and I would urge people in the audience to um, ask questions in this session, but also in other sessions using the facility in the, the chat. We've had a number of questions in advance, but also some during the event. Um, so I'm going to just try and I think we've probably got time for a couple of quick questions. Um, and the first one I wanted to bring out was a question to Herge on the legality question. So um, one audience member asked, what is the most time efficient procedure to achieve robust legal certainty on the WTO compatibility of a CBAM proposal? What is the most time efficient? Well, the issue is that uh, it depends on what you mean, what you mean by uh, certainty. Uh, I guess that in order to achieve certainty, you need to go to WTO litigation, and in order to go to WTO litigation, you need to go all the way. And it's difficult because there is a problem with the appellate body at, this, at present. So uh, it's um, even, let's put it in simple. 
the most efficient uh, approach to achieve legal certainty under the present law is, is not efficient. The other way would simply be to adopt uh, uh, a global treaty that includes uh, common carbon pricing, but that is unrealistic. Thank you, Hoke. Uh, Hosuk, we also had a number of questions around, should we say, the, the Europe's near neighbours. So questions around the implications on the Western Balkans, on the countries of the Eastern Partnership, which include places like Armenia and Azerbaijan. Um, do you have any specific thoughts about that and indeed um, how uh, those countries might want to, you know, the implications of, of, of this proposal for those countries? Well, um, I think it is indeed a very uh, pertinent example that we bring up also in the report because, of course, they are very dependent on the sing ac having access to the single market and the basic materials uh, tend to be one of the first things as these economies want to export to the single market because they are very competitive at it. Um, they basically have a choice uh, and I think the Ukraine example is very telling. Uh, because if you look at the Ukraine EU DCFTA, it was actually stipulated that Ukraine needed to adopt something that looked very much like an EU uh, um, ETS. And therefore, they have either the choice to actually to seek different markets or like Ukraine have done, adapt to the realities of the single market and hope that the uh, CBAM measures will display enough of regional competitors, competitors like, for example, like Russia, and to try to take over their market shares. And that's a commercial decision and we are very crude about it, actually in this report, but this is sometimes what uh, political economy of these basic materials come down to in the end. And a version of that question to Hector and, and Benza from, from Cambridge Econometrics. So we've done modeling about the economic impact. Could does it does the modeling give specific details in terms of the implications for particular countries? And again, the kind of that's that's raised with regard to the Western Balkans, but I'm sure others in the audience might be interested in it, in the perspective about whether it gives insights into the outcomes for other countries. Yeah, uh, indeed. In in the report, it's uh, well in the presentation, it was uh, quite summarised just for the for the slides and with the time available. And there is a bit more detail in the report, and there are member state level results underpinning all of this. Now, it vary, the results vary by member state, mainly depending on the relatively uh, importance of the sectoral shares within the member countries. Um, but there are, there are a few other factors as well. But generally, if you break it down to sectors, you start to get quite a good picture of what's going on. Excellent. And then a final one back to Jorge. Um, so do you think the fact that the CBAM proposal foresees that the revenues from a, a proposed CBAM will go to the EU general budget and not only be used to bring the economy would be a problem for its WGA compatibility? So if, if, you, if you mean the fact that, uh, I mean, the uh, key aspect of the macroeconometric analysis was how you use the money, <laughs> how you use the money of the certificate. Uh, so the question is, uh, would that be a problem from uh, the perspective of European law or from the perspective of international law? Well, the, there may be a, an issue uh, from the perspective of international law on, on, on qualifying the CBAM. Huh? So uh, the EU would like to, in, in a litigation proceeding, they would like to uh, qualify it as a tax because that would have certain advantages. And the use of the revenues could uh, have an impact on the qualification of the measure. Uh, but uh, it, it very much depends on the, uh, on the, and that's a problem with law. I mean, it very much depends on specificities and on the, on the specific uh, uh, way in which are these allocated. But uh, macroeconomically, and Hector uh, and, and Sana were saying that earlier, I think it's, it's absolutely crucial. And one final question for you all. Uh, I think this is a question that you might, men, a number of you may want to weigh in on, um, is that, so there was a question about the fact that in the report, we've talked about different venues for, uh, in, in terms of presenting alternatives to CBAM, we've talked about venues where, greater multilateral action or, or bilateral action could take place. But the question was, what kind of policies would we see adopted within those venues? What, what kind of things would have the most impact? And I think that's probably a little bit beyond the scope of what we looked at, but I'm just open to any of the, any of the team giving your thoughts, like, is it, is it about disclosure? Is it about product standards? What, 
what would you see as being good common policies that could be adopted? Sana, did you have any perspective on that? Um, well, obviously, um, there is quite a lot more discussion about this in the report, although it's not the main focus of the report. Um, I think like, from a purely personal perspective, I would say that we would really need to look at the finer detail of how these alternatives could be implemented. Um, some of them sound great on the paper, but whether they could actually be practically implemented. Um, I think one of the um, conclusions from the SEPS event on uh, or last Friday was that climate clubs are a great idea, but we just don't have the time in our hands to wait until we can get those clubs together. Um, so in that sense, in unilaterally imposed CBAMs might be the way to get started. Yeah, perhaps very quickly. I think it's something that we should probably um, think more closely about is policy mixes. I mean, the, 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 the Stephen has been uh, mainly understood uh, and assessed as a measure as itself, but um, it, it's very important to see it within a, a, a set of policies. And one trade-related policy, which is very important, is, trade, is, is public procurement. Uh, it's trade-related. I mean, we, we, we mentioned that in passing, but we, we didn't enter into the discussion. That is a very powerful tool that uh, for which there is a lot of space in international law. Great, thank you. And thank you all for your time and energy and, and uh, thank you all for your work on the report. I'm afraid we're going to have to move on just to bring in some other voices. We've, we're getting a, a flood of questions at this point, but some of which we might try and pick up bilaterally, but we'll also see if we can come back to them in further Q&A sessions. But I'd like to ask, a, I'd like to move on to, to take some reflections from, from an EU member state and a, a third country representative. So I'm very pleased that we should be able to be joined by Pierre Jeremy, who is advisor in charge of heavy industries, energy and sector economy to the minister in charge of industry in, in France. Uh, Pierre, I know we, we were hearing you earlier, but we were having some video problems, but hopefully we can uh, both hear you and if you were able to, certainly we can hear you. But maybe if I could ask you to share your thoughts on this, and at least we've got the, the slide that we can use. Well, th thank you very much for this uh, for this opportunity to to discuss CBAM and its uh, and its role as a key driver for climate action from uh, uh, the, the modest perspective of an EU member state. And, and first of all, let me thank uh, uh, C CISL and all the attendants to this event for taking time to discuss this crucial issue of um, how we can best address uh, collectively carbon leakage, how we can best design a carbon border adjustment mechanism in the general framework of the proposal set out by the Commission and how it does articulate with a world within a world where um, an open and um, uh, level level playing field based uh, uh, free trade uh, is here to stay. So as you know more than five years ago um, in Paris since I'm uh, talking to you over the phone, uh, well, leaders agreed to make significant efforts to limit global warming well below two degrees by the end of the century. And to achieve this common goal of the Paris Agreement, um, France and all EU member states and many other countries have endorsed an objective of climate neutrality by mid-century. As you know, several developments in Europe and other world have recently given um, uh, enhanced hope that together we can collectively address this global challenge in a, an even more meaningful way. Uh, in, in this context, the, the European Union has increased last September to 55% its target of net greenhouse gas emissions for 2030 compared to 1990 levels, which gives a very strong positive signal. And we believe that uh, the renewed US climate ambitions and generally speaking, uh, the uh, increased commitments by uh, key global trade partners are very promising steps in the context of the upcoming uh, COP26 in Glasgow. So, as you know, France has a very long standing uh, commitment to decarbonize its economy and, and to reaching carbon neutrality. Nonetheless, over the past years, greenhouse gas emissions have been declining steadily, but we must speed up the dynamic. And furthermore, while emissions have decreased in France by around 40% since 1990, our carbon footprint has risen by 17%. So this means that carbon leakage is a very massive and undeniable issue, 
which challenges both the environmental credibility, but also the, the political and social sustainability of the transition. Um, th this is why France has allocated a very significant share of its uh, stimulus plan to the greening of our economy. And this is uh, an effort that we uh, strive to um, uh, extend within the framework of the France 2030 uh, plan announced by the uh, President Macron um, on October 12th, um, with the idea to considerably speed up the low carbon transition of the economy. And almost one third of the 100 billion of the stimulus plan are devoted to energy efficiency, building innovation, decarbonized transport, low carbon energy. And this is for us a very um, important focus of our uh, economic policy uh, policy mix. In parallel, um, the European Union has strengthened its um, its package of climate policies to deliver its new objective for 2030 once again in a very uh, fully encompassing policy mix. And this entails a very, uh, much welcome strengthening of the carbon pricing policy via um, a, a revision of the uh, ETS directive, which now will cover almost half of the EU's greenhouse gas emissions. It also includes, uh, through a parameter adjustment, an implicit uh, drive to uh, push forward the carbon price. And we've seen that the um, expectations by market actors have, generally speaking, matched what was in the uh, EU Commission's um, uh, in the European Commission's um, impact assessment, because the impact assessment says, uh, generally speaking, a price between 45 and 55 euros per ton, with possibly uh, scenarios where it could go to 85 by the end of the decade. And we've generally hovered in this, um, in this uh, uh, levels since uh, the past few months. So it, this means that it's meeting its goals and that market operators are already uh, pricing in the impact of this revision. So to date, the European Union is one of the very few economies around the world that has a price level that is uh, in line with the ambitions of the Paris agreements. But more than three quarters of global emissions do not face any form of carbon pricing. So th this remains an unsustainable situation, both on an environmental point of view, but also from a, uh, a social acceptance point of view and from a, a it's it's basically a matter of equity and to be very clear um, as we strengthen our climate commitments we also need to address much more uh, carbon leakage which is very likely to, to intensify as uh, as the spread between um, uh, the most uh, the countries that have that are most uh, focused on addressing global warming and those that choose not to use uh, carbon pricing instruments uh, is uh, is uh, going to intensify and this has a very uh, important consequence it is that so far the existing eu instruments to tackle carbon leakage such as free allowances in the uh, ets system are obviously uh, crucial to maintain a level playing field but they fall short when it comes to addressing the issue by providing incentives to implement the new 2030 net emissions reduction targets. So um, as a consequence, we need to implement more effective instruments that have a better pass through to the end consumer and that incentivize better investments in deep decarbonization of key sectors. And this is, in our view, the main point of the carbon border adjustment mechanism it, it does change the rules in the market in the market inside the eu it does uh, in the end give a very significant competitiveness edge to those producers within the eu that have uh, made the, that made the choice of reducing their emissions because it's um, it allows them to capture part of uh, the green premium or the additional value from producing a low carbon product when they're selling it within the EU. And, and this is for us a fundamental part as it helps building a, a deep decarbonization strategy that shares evenly the burden between uh, industrials in, within the EU and consumers and the taxpayer. And this is for us the key point of CBAM. It is not the only uh, proper, proper Really, um, interesting property of CBAM. Another point is that CBAM is and should be designed 
uh, input compatibility with the WTO rules. And it is our belief that uh, the position set out by the European Commission is indeed fully compatible with the WTO um, uh, legal texts. And um, it is in that regard uh, a very fair device because it will be implemented in a transparent and coordinated manner with our trading partners without any form of discrimination between domestic and foreign producers. And this is something that we look forward to maintaining within uh, the upcoming discussions on the CBAM text. Nonetheless, you, we should also embrace the, um, yeah, if I can have just one more minute. Sure, of we course. Can, we, can, we, need also to, we need also to embrace the fact that CBAM will also be a tool to incentivize our trade partners to uh, address climate change and set their own pricing mechanisms. And this is probably the second very important property of CBAM. It is that it is some kind of um, uh, a um, it, is, it is a way of um, uh, sending a positive reinforcement to our trade partners and to help them um, get, get up in their climate commitment. So um, thanks. Thank you for that very thorough and uh, very clear overview in terms of the position of France and the, its support for this, this approach. Uh, perhaps I could invite our next um, reflection, which is from a third country representative, Katrina Rourke, Vice President of Policy at the Climate Leadership Council. So a uh, perspective from um, an American kind of business community uh, point of view and somebody who's worked a lot on these, these kind of issues. Katrina, over to you. Thank you so much, Elliot. I want to I want to thank the CSIL team and Microsoft for hosting this event, and I want to commend the report authors. Uh, this is the most extraordinarily important climate policy issue we're facing right now. This this junction between domestic climate policies and trade, and the the layered analysis in this report is a terrific contribution to the literature. So I just want to um, commend you and and say thank you for enhancing the conversation so much. Um, some some reflections. So uh, one is is just a reminder that it, maybe we only have on paper so far the EU CBAM, but without a doubt we are we are moving as a global community to connecting climate policy and trade policy. So the the CBAM is is in the Fit for 55 package. As Sana was remarking, we'll see how it evolves over time, but but the European Union is moving on this. We have also heard officials in the governments of Canada, Japan, the UK, and the US suggest that a border carbon adjustment um, is an important part of climate policy, and they are looking for options to, to integrate this. Uh, and, and maybe we'll judge how serious each of these countries um, may be, but together that forms more than half of the global economy which means it is not a question of, of whether we're going to introduce on a broad scale instruments like a CBAM or a border carbon adjustment, it is a question of what those instruments will look like um, and how our partnerships will evolve over time. And it's because uh, connecting climate and trade is absolutely indispensable to reaching long-term decarbonization targets. As the report reflects, the EU will not meet its 2050 decarbonization goals in the absence of a CBAM. Connecting climate and trade is imperative. Uh, I, I really appreciated um, what the previous speaker, Pierre Jeremy, said about um, France having 17% higher emissions, right? Because what, what climate policy has traditionally done is address production emissions within an economy, but not consumption emissions. And those emissions are embedded in global trade and happen overseas in jurisdictions that often have no carbon prices, or restrictive carbon policies um, whatsoever, especially in comparison to their destinations. So it's it's really it's really important that we ask the question: Is it possible to reach a decarbonized future without instruments like CBAM or a border adjustment being adopted by the most ambitious countries? Um, and I think I think the answer is no. Um, one more one more reflection on on the report, and then I'll, I'll turn to the the United States circumstances. So. Um, 
one of the terrific findings that you have uh, here in this report that we have found in our own research at the Climate Leadership Council is this concept of a, a green premium or a carbon advantage. So by introducing this mechanism of a border adjustment, you create commercial opportunity for the cleanest producers in the space. Um, and, and that means you can uh, increase investment even in very carbon intensive sectors in low carbon jurisdictions like the EU, like the United States, um, drive more manufacturing, create more jobs, and it is perfectly consistent with long-term global decarbonization and decarbonization of supply chains. So uh, climate ambition is now tied to commercial success. And this is turning climate diplomacy on its head. So far, the conversation uh, at the UNFCCC uh, has always been uh, this, this perception that we need every country to move together uh, so that nobody risks uh, losing market share, losing economic growth because their climate policies are more ambitious than their partners. And now we have evidence that with the right kinds of policies, um, policies that include an, an element that addresses the emissions in trade, the most ambitious policies can create more economic success at home even in industries that are very emissive. Um, and I think that is absolutely terrific news and can be, and can be a game changer on the international stage. So uh, briefly, the, the US landscape. Um, in his campaign platform, President Biden uh, talked about some form of a, of a border carbon adjustment in the United States. This, um, this carbon advantage, green premium, this, this concept that we have um, at home in the United States, very carbon efficient market actors who could benefit from some element of, of pricing overseas emissions. Um, that, that thread has been picked up by um, everybody from our sort of most ambitious climate champion, uh, Senator Sheldon Whitehouse, to uh, one of the largest skeptics of, of climate policy um, in, in the House of Representatives, the minority whip, Steve Scalise. And getting these two folks on the same page about a good news story on climate, I have to say has happened before and shows the opportunity to build new political coalitions around policies that, that integrate a climate action and our trade interests. Um, that, that sort of fight against the existing rules in international trade that can preference the lowest carbon, I'm um, sorry, the, the lowest cost but highest carbon producers over those producers um, that are going the extra mile to reduce their emissions. So this is a terrific political opportunity uh, to sort of set the stage in the US for, for renewed interest in doing um, something related to, to climate uh, ambition, which is uh, of course imperative to, to global ambition. Um, and, uh, and then I'll, I'll talk briefly, there's um, in, in almost all of the, the climate policy um, uh, legislative instruments that have been introduced in Congress, we have seen some element of a border carbon adjustment. But recently, we saw uh, Senator Chris Coons and Representative Scott Peters introduce a standalone border adjustment policy. So tabulate the regulatory costs to industry and use that as the basis of a border adjustment. And I know that um, very many people may have seen this policy instrument come out in the wake of the CBAM, in the midst of this conflict over Section 232 tariffs, and think this is some form of, of retaliation. But I am, a, I am a here to share a different perspective, which is that uh, what the US is looking for is a starting place for this conversation especially in advance of COP. So uh, Senator Coons will be leading a delegation uh, over to COP and, and he wants something to talk about and he wants to talk about a climate policy success opportunity and that is in connecting climate and trade. So um, what we have here is now an opportunity um, at the COP to talk about this idea that high ambition equals economic prosperity at home. Um, and uh, have a basis for the EU and the US to um, have a sort of like a troubleshooting conversation. 
how can we um, work together to address the emissions associated with traded goods? How can we address some, um, some technical challenges like measuring the emissions intensity of traded goods? How can we start a conversation um, because we know this instrument is inevitable. Connecting climate and trade is inevitable. So how can we start the conversation to make sure that these instruments are as successful as possible? And I totally agree um, with Sana that we cannot wait for, um, for a climate club or a carbon club, um, but these unilateral instruments form the basis of the conversation that will let us advance the ball into the future. Thank you very much. Katrina, thank you. That's That's been really helpful and really illuminating and great to get that parallel perspective from the US context. Um, and thank you for your kind words as well. So I'm now pleased to invite our distinguished panel of uh, different perspectives who will be able to reflect on the content of our report, or reflect on this issue. Um, so I should invite to join me on screen. We should have uh, well, Thomas Hornfeld, from, uh, who is Vice President for Sustainability and Public Affairs at SSAB, Susan, Dr. Susan Drager. Um, a senior fellow at the German Institute for International and Security Affairs. But, um, we have Dr. Alberto Arribas from uh, Microsoft, sustainability expert, uh, science lead for, in Europe for Microsoft. And of course, Anton Colombani um, from the Network Cabinet from uh, Vice Pre Executive Vice President Franz Timmermans, who uh, obviously has been responsible for leading the work on this. Um, thank you all for joining me. Um, I'm going to um, ask you all to kind of just maybe quickly open up by just letting me letting us have some initial reflections on the conversation so far and on the report and then we have some specific questions that we will um put to you all um including sort of other questions that will be coming in as, as we go but maybe if i could start with you antoine um just to, great to hear your thoughts on on the report and some of the issues that have been already raised so far yeah, thanks a lot. Thanks to you and thanks for organizing this very interesting uh, event. Um, maybe I'll start by, by recapping a bit what, we, what we're trying to do with the, the CBAM. So obviously we want to limit the rise in temperature to 1.5 uh, degrees and to that um, we have committed that Europe uh, will become climate neutral by 2050 and you know as well that a milestone in this journey is the reduction uh, by 55 percent of emissions by 2030 um, and I want to, to stress that these targets are now legal obligations uh, for the EU uh, these are enshrined in the EU climate law and it's first and foremost to, to comply with these obligations that the Commission has proposed um, its uh, comprehensive legislative package last July, uh, of which the, the CBAM is a, is a part also with the, the reform of the ETS and other pieces of legislation. Um, obviously, uh, to, to mitigate climate change, we need to act at, uh, at global level and, and uh, the Commission are, are fully mobilized. Uh, for the COP, uh, which will take place in a, in a few days. Apologies, Anton, we're, we're getting a bit stop-start with you. So I'm going to go to Suzanne next, and then maybe when I, I'll then yeah. uh, maybe go around the panel and then come back to you. Suzanne, I just wanted to get your thoughts on okay. the yeah. international acceptability of some of these proposals. Um, you know, particularly, so we've obviously put up, put some thinking forward, but maybe you might have a sense of um, whether some of the alternatives might be more palatable and, and what, what, how this conversation might be landing internationally. Over to you. Yeah, thanks, Elliot. I wonder whether we are talking about alternatives here or whether it's rather about complements. Um, in the report, there are several ideas uh, reflected and they are all valid ideas, so they are not as such things that I wouldn't sign up to basically a big role for the WGO or OECD for forums to discuss where countries could align their interests. Um, but I think uh, we have to keep in mind that there are different timelines in which we should discuss these uh, alternatives or complementary approaches. First and foremost, I think um, it needs to be understood that even though CBAM is just a proposal at this moment, it, even if it started in 2023 on the 1st of January, there will still be two years before it will enter a phase where 
there will be some cash um, um, being paid and it's not being paid by the exporting um, agents but rather by the importers so this needs to be kept in mind and it's uh, it's a cost burden basically on consumers within the eu and of also of course this relates to the discussion we had before um, how to handle this cost increase and how that all impacts the modeling and so on and so forth but that's not the point the point is that from 2026 onwards we will definitely have something to talk about also when it comes to retaliation because you cannot retaliate against anything that does not demand countries to pay uh, I still it's, it's a regulation that asks importers to start registration of their imports very early on and to attach a number of embedded carbon to the imported goods that are listed in the proposal so uh, the alternatives uh, that are mentioned is to move forward in preferential trade agreements, to move forward at the WTO level in discussing common interest on common clubs, which is a difficult framing, I guess, because we have clubs already all over the place, G7 being one. I mean, the G7 has really a good uh, phase at the moment, very positive when it comes to aligning the interest and supporting the COP26. And um, so I would like to to uh, um, address that um, your report is very good in, in naming the alternatives, but I think it needs a little add-on on how this could fly in which time on which time horizon we are projecting this. Um, we have a ge geopolitical issue with the WTO. There is not much support on reforming it, so any clauses that need, a, need agreement will not materialize anytime soon. And all the proposals with the forums and the talks and the registries are very important because they work their way around this bucket. Um, and I think that's why we need them too. And the CBAM is just giving impetus and it's giving momentum to addressing these issues that are overdue. Is, it's about um, finding common ground with trade partners on how to measure a carbon content, how to handle specific industries the EU would like to see decarbonize as soon as possible, and the US does. Um, but then a lack of regulatory yeah, harmonization or synchronization is, is just in the way of building, for instance, a carbon pricing club, right? So um, I would I would see um, most of the proposals made here as important forums in which these things can be addressed, and the role of the CBAM is really to to push for some more clarity and cooperative spirit in this respect. We will have difficulties in selling a CBAM to countries that are poor, that are feeling affected due to their export shares to the EU. That's basically not, or that won't be those that make a big difference in carbon emissions. And I think addressing um, this this kind of, well, we discuss um, the, the common but differentiated responsibilities, issues and exemptions, that is something that needs to be brought forward. And it could, because that is, um, that is basically uh, also understood in the trade regime and in bilateral trade relations that the EU has with poorer countries. So I stop here and probably can you, go sir. further in the discussion. Thank you. Absolutely. Alberto, just, just moving to you. I mean, I wonder what your thoughts are. Uh, Suzanne very clearly set out, you know, the, the role of the CBAM as sort of pushing further action. What do you see some of the potential outcomes? From the perspective of a company that's involved that's obviously present in an awful lot of countries so you know you have an interest both in supporting climate action but also in supporting um good international kind of accordance and and uh trade flows yeah no thank you very much elliot and, and before i go into answering the question congratulations to you and the whole team on the report because i have i have thoroughly enjoyed reading it and i think it's a very important very important contribution to this to this debate so as, as we have been discussing today, it's still the first step in a very long journey. So it's, it's difficult to kind of forecast exactly how, how things are going to develop. But I think that we can we can already say a few a few things. And, and the first one is that we expect that there will be a, an increased kind of need and demand for kind of common definitions and standards around embodied carbon, because something that the CBAMB is doing that is very, very clear is putting the spotlight into embodied carbon, which is, has been in many ways kind of the, a little bit forgotten when, when we have been talking about carbon emissions so far in, in preference of kind of emissions coming from, from energy consumption. So that's, that's going to be a very interesting development that need for these kind of common definitions and standards. 
The second one, of course, is, as you have just mentioned, CBAM is going to affect many countries inside and outside Europe. And this is going to drive a need as well for essentially being able to have interoperability between measurements and, and kind of accounting. And again, this is going to be something in which technology will play a very important role. So we expect to, to be able to help in this space, but it goes beyond technology to be able to create these kind of tools and platforms that enable the, the whole interoperability. The final thing that is, is clear to me is that what we should expect, we, we can expect that there are going to be changes resulting from conversations with all of our trading friends and, and partners in the European Union and, and the conversations inside the European Union. And what this is going to trigger is a need to essentially accelerate kind of a, a faster loop integrating changes across the science, technology and, and policy making interfaces, because we all want actually to be able to kind of integrate the best experiences and, and to bring kind of lessons learned as, as soon as possible. And again, we expect that there will be a, a role for technology in that, in that particular space. Excellent, thank you Alberto. I'm gonna to move to you, Thomas. Um, obviously, you're represented from the steel industry. The steel industry is very heavily discussed in relation to, to these topics. It would be great for you to share your thinking in terms of the industry's perspective. Um, and I guess if I particularly put you on the spot, you know, one of the key questions is this, if you could explain a little bit about some of the issues around exporting steel and the phasing out of free allowances in, in relation to the CBAM. Um, you know, this is something that's discussed a lot. It'd be great to hear your kind of, your inside view on from, from within the steel industry on, on what that issue is about and, and how it needs to evolve. Thank you. Um, I think that the starting point should be that we have a relatively CO2 efficient steel industry in Europe. We are uh, emitting less CO2 in our steel making operations than, than other parts of the world. Uh, and the industry is in a transition phase right now. And it is important that we continue that transition. I think uh, most European uh, steel companies do have a roadmap for getting rid of their uh, emissions. And if and when the free allowances, which is the carbon leakage mechanism that we have today, uh, is being phased out, then certainly CBAM could be something to, to look into. It's, it's an interesting concept. Uh, as always, the devil is in the detail. We've been working on the details of the ET, EU ETS trading scheme that we have today uh, for, for tens of years. Um, and, and when it comes to the CBAM, we need to be as careful with the implementation. Uh, I think. Um, a CBAM mechanism, which means that the imported steel would carry the same kind of carbon costs as European steel makers do, would certainly create a level playing field inside Europe among the steel makers. That is, that is certainly at least theoretically true. There are some details about, you know, manufacturing routes and so on, but let, let's not go into that. As Susanna was saying earlier, at the same time, it will increase the cost for consumers in the EU. We are raising the cost of steel in the EU. That is what is going to happen when we attach a price tag both to imported steel and uh, domestic uh, EU production uh, for carbon emissions. And I have nothing against that. I think, I mean, we need to incentivize the decarbonization. So that, that's fine. The important thing here is the level uh, playing field. Uh, the thing is that when we are exporting out of Europe, we do not longer have a level playing field because the European steelmakers still have the carbon costs uh, related to the EU ETS, but our global competitors in their respective home markets or in the global market do not have the same uh, cost. And, and that, that would then um, put European steelmakers at a competitive disadvantage, which would um, mean that we would then increase the steel production elsewhere in the world, which would have a negative effect on reducing CO2 emissions in the world. I, I think that is something that we need to, to, to realize. Um, and furthermore, we also need to, to realize that the customers of the European steel industry, let's, let's take a European truck maker as an example, that truck maker would then face higher steel costs, steel costs that are higher than outside the EU, which would put these this truck maker at a competitive disadvantage compared to imported trucks, but also 
compared to the global truck market when exporting out of the EU. Um, and this could then lead to another risk with this, which is circumvention, that this truck maker, instead of welding his truck chassis in the EU, would buy uh, steel outside the EU, weld the chassis outside the EU, and then import the chassis instead of importing the steel, um, which would then, again, have a negative effect on the decarbonization globally. One way of avoiding this that sometimes is being mentioned is to have some kind of CO2 VAT, value added CO2 tax, that this uh, carbon cost follows the uh, manufacturing chain or the supply chain so that it then can be calculated and reversed when exporting out of the EU. I know that this is technically complicated, but if you really want to incentivize and get a level playing field both inside and outside Europe, we need to take the issue with global competitiveness, both for the steel industry and its customers into account. Thank you, Thomas. I'm, I'm now going to try and bring Antoine back. Um, maybe we might do by sound and not by audio, just to make sure we can we can um, hear everything. And I, I'm not quite sure exactly, because it was a bit stop-start, exactly where, where we lost you, but Antoine, any sort of final remarks that you had on, in terms of your introductory reflections, but also I think we had a few other questions that have been put to you. Um, so noting, for example, that our analysis in the report is slightly different to um, the Commission's impact assessment, so in terms of the, the carbon savings, so any, any thoughts on that? And I guess that's a thought for our modelling team as well. But also this question about, I think it's a, it's a perennial in terms of the question list, what does it mean for exporting industries? You just heard, heard a little bit from Thomas bringing that to life. Um, so just great, over to you, Anton. Yes, thank you, and apologies for the connection issues. I hope you can hear me well now. Um, uh, no, I just wanted to to emphasize that the the CBAM is is so to speak the the companion to the extra climate ambition of the EU and the increased decarbonization uh, efforts that we need over the coming decade in the in the sectors which are covered, because whatever happens, we need. Uh, uh, to, to have effective protection against carbon leakage, uh, and uh, otherwise it, it's it's uh, it's self-defeating. I mean, to to reduce emissions in the EU, uh, while this leads to increased emissions outside the EU, um, because the the purpose is to address climate change, of course. Um, and uh, the current issue with the instrument that we have, because we have an instrument to to tackle carbon leakage. Uh, is that uh, the, the, this instrument, the free allowances under the ETS, also um, dampens the incentives to decarbonize in those sectors. So this is why we, we see the CBAM as a, an important component uh, of the, the package, which is a co coherent and comprehensive package we have put on the table last July. Uh, just a few, a few thoughts on a, a couple of points on the, on the export side. Um, well, the, the justification, the reason why we have uh, free allowances at present is uh, to uh, avoid carbon leakage, which is uh, uh, linked to the EU ETS, the fact that we have a carbon price inside the EU. And basically, uh, once you have a CBAM, the justification for this disappears, so eventually the two have to um, uh, well, one has to replace the other. The CBAM has to replace free allocation. What we have conceived is a, is a transitional period uh, because this cannot happen uh, from one day to the next. And we do this in a way that is also non-discriminatory and where there's no uh, double protection, so to speak. Um, then on, uh, on uh, exports, um, I mean, there is out there this um, request from... Uh, Parts of industry to have something akin to an export rebate. However, uh, we know that this type of measure uh, would uh, would be very controversial uh, in terms of um, compatibility with WTO, uh, and there would be a risk also of uh, of retaliation in uh, in such a case. Uh, and as for the impact on the value chain. Uh, there is um, a provision to avoid circumvention, uh, 
uh, in our proposal. So we, we have foreseen a provision uh, against circumvention. Obviously, uh, the impact of value on value chains is also something we have assessed in the impact assessment. Our conclusion is that it is overall uh, quite expected to be quite moderate. Nevertheless, it will have to be continuously assessed uh, as we implement the CBAM, and, and the CBAM is also conceived by design as, a, as an instrument which can be extended uh, in the future, and you will have a first uh, review uh, in the in the proposal. It's uh, in 2025 where we will examine uh, potentially the coverage of indirect emissions and potentially covering other uh, products as well. Uh, and so uh, we are starting with uh, a number of uh, specific products, uh, but the issue of impact uh, on value chains could be tackled uh, further down the line as well. Uh, I will not go much into you know what what accounts for the differences between the two uh, impact assessments, um, but uh, what I what I can say is that our uh, analysis is that CBAM is. Uh, is a measure that basically contributes to uh, reduction of CO2 emissions, uh, both abroad and in the EU. Uh, and uh, it is therefore a measure which is uh, uh, justified as a climate policy measure, and not a trade policy measure or a competitiveness measure. Uh, it's really a measure which, uh, which is part of a, a policy mix, I would say, to achieve um, our more ambitious climate target for 2030 and beyond to achieve the, the climate neutrality objective. Thank you very much. Thank you, Antoine. And I, I think I understand that you have to, to leave us now. So um, I'm going to uh, put my last few questions to the other panel members. Um, I have a I have a, a set of questions. So we, we're having quite a good mix of questions around carbon footprinting, um, carbon accounting, sort of tracing carbon through the supply chain. And I think maybe Thomas and Alberta, it'd be interesting to hear either of your thoughts on that. So, you know, this is a this is an area where we are sort of seeing more and more interest. How do you how do you label, how do you kind of track the carbon through the supply chain? Um, because it seems it's important for CBAM design and implementation, but it's likely important for other policy mechanisms as well. Um, Alberta, maybe if I could start with you. Yeah, thank you, Elliot. Yeah, so I think this is a, a critical issue because until now we have had relatively simplistic ways of doing the calculations of embodied carbon, simply just taking essentially a, an amount of a material, the of a material and multiplying it for a, by a carbon factor. And we have to keep in mind that if we use kind of the same uniform global kind of carbon factor constant, we are going to get exactly the same the same result. And that's going to hide kind of very important regional or local variations. An example here can be a, a steel producer that puts a lot of effort into reducing their emissions and reduce them by 90%. But if in the way that I do the accounting, I'm still using the same kind of global uniform constant to calculate the total emissions, I will not see any of those changes coming into, into my accounting. And that means that we really need to start just kind of having accounting methods that are able to use things like Internet of Things and new sensors and real-time measurement so we can bring these local variations that are updated in real time so we have a, a proper measurement of what is the, the kind of the cost from a carbon emissions point of view of the generation of any material. Without that, essentially, we, we are lacking one of the most effective kind of incentive measurements towards producers to really be able to do the right thing and reduce their carbon emissions. Excellent. Thank you, Alberto. Thomas, I mean, a similar question to you, you know, what do you see, particularly given the CBAM is, is targeted, is aiming to affect um, the industries that are most described as energy intensive, do you see particular ways of standardising um, reporting around the carbon content of of the products of those energy intensive industries? Um, it would be nice if we could. Let, put, let me put it that way. Um, I think it is very complex and what we shouldn't do is to use simplified mechanisms here. There is a, a significant difference in CO2 intensity among steelmakers already today and it's going to be worse or rather better in the future because a lot of European steam makers are going to de decarbonize a lot faster uh, than their global competitors. Um, 
there are, uh, I think the best instrument that we have today are environmental product declarations and, and those kind of things. But even if they are a standardized uh, uh, protocol, a standardized way of, of showing your emissions, there are so many preconditions that you can define yourself that they are actually hard to combine. Um, I guess that uh, some of us are aware of the EU initiative, uh, PEF, the product environmental footprint, which would be, if properly standardized, a way also of helping people making the right decision and, and potentially track embodied carbon throughout the value chain. And let me just say that it's probably a, a dream scenario, but if we could track carbon emissions or, or embedded carbon throughout the value chain all the way to the consumer, then we could potentially, as Susan talked a little about, tax CO2 emissions at the consumer instead of the producer. And then we wouldn't need a CBAM, then we wouldn't need uh, other types of emission costs because then everybody competing in the European uh, consumer market would face the same type of emission costs and the same, same type of incentive to decarbonize, regardless of whether you're based inside or outside Europe. Uh, and, and that would be a very elegant model, but I guess I would have to wait a few years before that is implemented. Thanks, Thomas. Suzanne, um, your name is just, just brought up. So from the international perspective, so a lot of the questions we're getting on, or a significant number of the questions we're getting are around the impact on of on this conversation of Brexit and vice versa. So, for example, will would is there a likelihood that the Brexit process could delay the implementation of CBAM? And equivalently, is there a likelihood that um, having the CBAM happen will affect the, the UK's ability to um, deliver some of its own climate goals? So, you know, it's obviously it's a near neighbour, it's a, it's a big economy. I wonder what your thought is on that. Usually, I trust that the, both parties are interested, EU and UK, in, in, in bringing forward their common interests in climate policy, and that um, due to the well, not so nice negotiations on the, on the Brexit, there has been a kind of yeah. Well, I, I try to be diplomatic, so I think that um, the, the interest is on both ends, not to block each other when it comes to climate policy making. And uh, the CBAM proposal actually is, um, is very explicit on how it would like to handle the situation and uh, that it would like to see a linking of the ETS uh, between UK and the EU and well, would like to build on this, of course, we will see during the next uh, few months of discussion whether we will stick to that from the EU part uh, or whether the UK will will immediately answer whether CBAM that should be recognized in a, in a way that it makes sense for both. And um, so, yeah, it's, it's subject to this overall situation that the, the, the political climate is not so friendly when it comes to the trade related agreements between the two parties. Then again, looking at the COP and looking at the role of UK in the world when it comes to climate, UK was always pushing and pulling towards the EU and I, I have I really trust that this uh, will go away this longer 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 term stance. Um, it very much depends on the governments in place and we'll see what's going to happen with the new German government also in this respect. Uh, so um, well, I'm rather not so skeptical on this. It's a, it's a lot of noise, but I think technically it's it's on a good way. I'm building on this question of international relations. So we've we've had a question around the uh, the African continental free trade area, um, and kind of the implications of the CBAM proposal for that. And I, I connected to that, there's a, there's a kind of question that I think you could probably extend to any developing country with a significant trade relationship with Europe, is you know, what would be the, the value or the benefit of having um, support to enable corporates and, and you know, parts of the supply chain to, to become more compliant with the CBAM in, in developing country context? Now, I said before that I think it's very advisable to, to find a way to exempt those countries that really have a very small share of 
carbon that they deliver to the EU. And if there is a higher share, there should be a, a solution that needs cooperation and helping on the technological end. At the moment, the proposal is very watertight when it comes to the WTO principles for good reasons. That means there's, there's no exemptions included at the moment. Um, although exemptions are compatible with the WTO situation, although again, this needs to be this negotiate, negotiated on a separate track, which makes a lot of work. So, so in principle, we, we can we can reach over to the poor countries either as part of the trade relations we have established as EU with them, or speaking technically, we could uh, invert in the proposal a de minimis clause that makes them exempt by automatically because they are not playing a major role in these five sectors. We know cases where there is a high dependence on EU, on delivery to EU markets, and I think it, we go any further, we can go any further if we're not addressing them uh, with these countries bilaterally. Mozambique is a well-known example for aluminum deliveries to the EU. So it will be tedious, it will be uh, subject to things the External Action Service and the EU Commission as such need to address. I think it's too early to, to move forward on this. Um, at the COP I expect a lot of um, questions in this regard. The EU will have to address these questions and we'll try to um, make some offers at least, um, well, not as a lip service, but at least signal that it is open to adjustments here. That's great. For my last couple of questions, I wanted to bring Pierre and Katrina back in, if that's okay. Um, so just, just briefly, um, yeah, I, hopefully you've been able to, to follow this conversation. I'm just struck, you know, you, you very clearly set out the benefits, the economic benefits, the kind of the, the climate benefits of, of this proposal. And in this conversation, there's been quite a lot of um, engagement with some of the more indirect kind of economic challenges. So the risk of circumnavigation, the risk of, of challenges to export markets. What's, can I ask, what's your sort of thought thinking in response to some of those challenges? Thanks. So I, I, I guess my thinking boils down to um, uh, we need to start the conversation so we can we can tackle those challenges. Uh, very many of these concerns are already built into trade law. In the United States, we have really strict rules about clarifying country of origin, for example. Uh, and so we can rely on what we already know how to do in the trade system. But what we don't have in the trade system yet is this ability to uh, track emissions where they happen and associate them with individual goods. So we, we need to have an international conversation about the correct ways of doing that. In, in my view, um, you know, the United States should set the rules so that they benefit US actors. Um, but we certainly need to have a conversation about how to make those rules um, fair and clear and enforceable in, uh, in jurisdictions that impose something like a border adjustment and, and clarify uh, how we deal with gaps in, in reporting and information about, about CO2 emissions associated with products. So uh, we, yeah, we just have to have a conversation at the, at the multilateral level to tackle these challenges so that we can build on what we already know how to do in the trade system. Thank you, Katrine. That was great. Pierre, are you are you with us? So apparently you're connected, but we're not hearing you. So I'm unfortunately I would I would go to you for a, for a final answer, but it doesn't sound like it's possible. Um, instead, can I can I go to you, Alberto? So uh, Microsoft, you've been supporting a, a wide range of, of climate conversations and, and activities. Um, we're obviously just about to we are days away from COP26. Um, we've just kind of engaged with uh, an in-depth, detailed uh, exploration of the relationship between climate and trade, particularly with regard to CBAMs. What are some of, what would you hope to see that could maybe move this conversation forward as we as we go into that big international moment? Yeah, I think it comes back to, to the point that Katrina was just mentioning again, just, just now in terms of being able to really do the, the measuring and the accounting and, and the traceability better that we are able to do this now. And, one of the reasons that we are engaged across all of these conversations is because we really believe that technology has a very important role to play in this space to really enable that traceability and really improve 
the development of these kind of measuring and accounting systems. So this is something that we really, really want to help and, and we want to see it happening because in the absence of these kind of measuring and accounting and, and systems that can facilitate interoper interoperability, the whole conversation is very difficult. So we really hope that by kind of doing the groundwork to facilitate this, we will end with better standards and better systems that enable them to have all of these open conversations that bring everybody together for essentially the great goal, which is to reduce and eliminate the, the carbon emissions. Everybody, I'd like to thank every, thank you, Alberto, for that great answer, which I think is, is going to be the last opportunity we're going to have for the Q&A. Thank you all for participating and all of your, your time and, and insights. That's been an incredibly helpful conversation. Um, it just falls to me to, to wrap up and sum up what um, has been a, a really fascinating event, a really fascinating set of conversations. We set out with our report to, to start a conversation. Obviously, the conversation about CBAMs is definitely very much happening. Um, but to, to give it a bit more uh, detail, a bit more focus, to provide some of the, the insights that would help people talk in an informed manner. I feel on the basis of today's conversation that we have at least partially succeeded. So thank you all for that. Thank you all for the flow of questions that um, has, has come through. We're very sorry we haven't been able to deal with all of them or even most of them. I think we probably uh, dipped in, the, in, the, in the, the very top of the pool of questions. Um, we will see what we can do in terms of getting some responses back to some people, um, so bear with us. Um, there will be a recording available and we will share the presentation, um, uh, hopefully in the thank you email that all, all the audience members should get and we'll make sure that's, that's available as well. But um, do, do have a look at the report and the detail, do, do keep engaging with us, share your thinking about how we should take some of this, this research and analysis. Um, and we will look forward to engaging with you in future events, future activities. But without too much other things to say, thank you very much. <laughs>